Welcome to the Talberg Foundation podcast series, New Thinking for a New World. Host Alan Stogo welcomes leaders from around the world to explore the issues that are challenging and changing their societies. From climate change to democracy under siege to geopolitics and beyond, we are looking for ideas that can make all our lives better. My guest today is Kishore Mabubani, who is widely recognized as one of the go-to strategists who is thinking about the interaction, perhaps the collision, of the two superpowers of the early 21st century, China and the United States. Kishore is a diplomat, an academic, an author, and someone who understands Asia intimately from his home base in Singapore. His most recent book asks, has China won? Welcome, Kishore. My pleasure to join you, Alan. Let me start with a simple question, albeit a different one than the title of your book. What does China want? The answer is actually surprisingly clear. China doesn't want to be ever humiliated again in the way that it was humiliated from 1842 to 1949. And if anybody in the U.S. wants to understand what China wants, They should study this century of humiliation, study how much pain the Chinese suffered when the British forced them to accept opium in return for Chinese tea. And when the Chinese refused, the British, of course, seized Hong Kong, seized Chinese territory, set up settlements with uh, extraterritorial rights inside China. And when the Chinese resisted, British and French forces destroyed the Summer Palace in 1860. And if you burn down the Louvre, the British Parliament, the the Vatican and uh, Buckingham Palace, you still would have done less damage than by burning down the Summer Palace in 1860. So it's very important to understand how much the Chinese suffered before you can understand what they want in the 21st century. That is 70 years already of recovery from that 100 years of humiliation, a period during which a series of Chinese leaders have remade the country politically, socially, economically, have repositioned it globally. It is either the largest or the second largest economy. It is the dominant power, arguably, in Asia, so forth and so on. At what point does China's self-perception switch from looking backward to that period of humiliation to looking forward to a period, if not of domination, well, let's say domination or cooperation or something else? What will it take? Uh, Again, the answer is very clear. Uh, What the Chinese want more than anything else uh, is just to be treated with respect and courtesy and accepted as an equal. So you notice that all these verbal assaults that are being carried out uh, by the United States, to some extent by the United Kingdom, to some extent by Australia, the Anglo-Saxon media, they are basically trying to deny the legitimacy of the Chinese government and the Chinese system. And, you know, as you know, the Chinese for a long time, uh, following the advice of Deng Xiaoping, said, oh, we will swallow our bitter humiliation, we will hide our capacities, we will not, you know, grab leadership positions in the world. They took a low profile But I think after a while, because they've succeeded so much, they now have the world's largest middle-class population. They feel now a domestic pressure to respond to any insults to China very strongly. So, you know, and this is why we are witnessing a great tragedy now. Because frankly, it would be best for the world to China, for China to emerge as a happy dragon rather than an angry dragon. And the West, uh, which, which, which was responsible for the century of humiliation, should now has an opportunity to handle China right, and the West is handling China all wrong. And, and it's, not, it's not in the Western interest, not in China's interest to see this tragedy unfold. They should learn to adopt a, a view of live and let live, And China will not try to interfere in U.S. elections. China will not try to uh, change the government in uh, Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. said, okay, 
You have your government. That's your choice. As long as you don't interfere in our, with us, we will not interfere with you. Remarkably, I'm not sure it's working in this sense. I saw a poll that came out very recently by the Pew Research people. They looked at opinion in the major industrial countries, everyone from Australia and the United States, Germany, France, Netherlands, Japan, Canada, and consistently the perception of China in all of those countries is increasingly negative. You put it in the context, and I'm, I'm pleased you did, of the broader West as opposed to just the U.S. We'll get to the U.S. in a moment. Is it because these countries are on the defensive in terms of their own performance, their own identity? Is it because they're unable to grapple with a new China? Why are the tensions rising? Uh, well, I, you know, I can assure you, Alan, just imagine when you began interviewing me, there's a lovely little cat sitting behind you, purring away, smiling at you. And when we finish this interview, after 30 minutes, you turn around and the cat has become a tiger. <laughs> and you say, wow, what happened to that cat? Right? So, uh, and that's basically what China has become. I mean, China has gone from having a GNP in purchasing power parity terms that was less than 10% of the United States. Now this uh, GNP PPP terms has become bigger. So everybody is saying, oh, why isn't China being so meek and so docile anymore? Why is it showing its teeth? And the, the, the simple answer is that it is, is what all great powers do. And, you know, Graham Allison of Harvard has a wonderful uh, point. He says, Americans keep wishing that China would be like us. Let's be careful what we wish for, because China today is exactly where America was at the end of the 19th century, when Teddy Roosevelt came along, and guess what? He started a few wars. He declared war on the uh, Spanish, uh, conquered Philippines. <laughs> you know, you know, it's amazing. The Chinese actually have not fought a war in 40 years. Amazing. So I, I think that a lot of the problems is due to the unrealistic expectations of the West vis-a-vis -vis China, both in terms of its internal evolution and in terms of its external behavior. And great powers will behave like great powers, by the way. Just as the United States behaves as a great power, China will behave uh, as a great power. But I would also ask you, if you can, to try and take a tour of Africa and ask the African states, would they like more Chinese investment? Uh, and, and you should, the most important statistic any Westerner should know is that there are 193 countries who are member states of the UN, They were, uh, including China. 192 were invited to join the Belt and Road Initiative that China launched a few years ago. And you're free to join or not to join. United States didn't join, Japan didn't join, India didn't join, Australia didn't join. But you know what? Over about 130 countries have joined <laughs> out of 193. That's, that's pretty good. That's about a two-thirds ratio of countries in the world who are voluntarily uh, joining the Belt and Road Initiative. So what you get in the Anglo-Saxon media is a rather distorted perspective of, of China. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying that China is benign, benevolent, and a, a, a saint. It's, no great power is a saint. There's no such thing as a benevolent great power. All great powers are selfish and will push their own interests. That's a reality. But at the same time, the Chinese are being very careful in not starting wars, in not uh, going on shooting expeditions, and, and are trying still, to be fair to them, to emerge peacefully. Arguably, part of the problem is the larger global system. This one was designed in the wake of World War II. This China was not at the table but evolved over the course of those last 70 years to become a superpower. A few years ago, the Chinese leadership talked about the opportunity for a new great power relationship, clearly implied that the system could be renegotiated and ought to be renegotiated to reflect the new realities of the 21st century, as opposed to the old realities of the mid 20th century. Do you think we need to renegotiate the global arrangements for this new world? Well, 
Let me share some good news with you. We need good news these days, so please. <laughs> the, 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 to your a surprise and maybe to the surprise of many of your listeners, the Chinese love the 1945 rules-based order. And they love the 1945 rules-based order because that's the order that has facilitated China's return as a great power. And the Chinese, by the way, and this is almost like part of the Chinese psyche. The Chinese, one thing the Chinese fear more than anything else, as, and this is a result of the 4,000 years of history, is when order breaks down, when there's chaos. The Chinese just psychologically don't like chaos. They like to have rules, clear rules. And they've discovered that the 1945 rules-based order, including organizations like the World Trade Organization, have facilitated uh, China's rise. And today, China is the world's number one trading power. And China is the world's number one beneficiary uh, of the global multilateral system. China, which didn't create the 95 rules based, 1945 rules-based order, is happy to live with it. United States, which create and, and Europe, which created the 1945 rules-based order, is undermining it by walking away from conventions like the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, walking away from the World Health Organization, walking away from the World Court. So it, it is actually quite a strange situation when it is, when it is in the Western interest <laughs> to preserve a rules-based order which eventually will constrain, which will constrain China, the West is undercutting it when it should be strengthening it. And, and in fact, and, and the opposite part of it is China should be undercutting it and not strengthening it, but China is strengthening it. And that, but for the proof of that, there are now four UN organizations run by Chinese nationals. Now, you may think that, and this is the way the United States portrays it, oh, the Chinese are smuggling Chinese Trojan horses into the UN system. No, 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 it's the other way around. We are actually using the, the you are, this Chinese appointments end up becoming Trojan horses of the UN system inside China. And I persuade China to stay by this rules-based order. So therefore, what the United States and the West are doing in terms of undermining the rules-based order, they're going against their own long-term interests. Let's segue to the relationship between China and the United States in particular. Under President Obama, we had the idea of a pivot to Asia, but that pivot to Asia seemed to be to stand up a, a more aggressive U.S. position in Asia. So the TPP, for example, was explicitly structured to exclude China, but include the United States. Under President Trump, of course, you've had a very aggressive effort in his mind and in his cabinet's mind to reset the relationship, which they view as China unfairly taking advantage of the WTO, of the rules-based order, of not living up to obligations, put aside the credibility or veracity of those, those descriptions, we are where we are. As we go forward, China and the US have to come to grips with each other one way or the other if we're going to have what you say China wants and what I would argue the U.S. wants, which is a peaceful, prosperous world. How do we get there? Well, I think, frankly, uh, whether it's Trump or Biden, the geopolitical contest between U.S. and China will continue for structural reasons because no number one power gives up its number one position without make it, making a fight about it. This is just the logic of geopolitics. But going forward, I think we have a 10-year window a very important 10-year window because if you really want to create or have a world in which China is, to quote Bob Zalek, a responsible stakeholder, we must learn to treat China responsibly and work with China and not insult uh, China all the time. Not try to change the Chinese internal system because you cannot change it. Nobody can change it from outside. And the most important thing the United States has to do, and this is why I begin the book by saying that I had a one-on-one -on -one lunch with Henry Kissinger. And at the end of the lunch, Henry Kissinger allowed me to cite him saying that the fundamental problem with the United States is that it has no long-term strategy. 
to dealing with uh, China, whereas the Chinese do have a long-term strategy and are patiently accumulating assets because time is on their side now. So what the United States needs to do is ask some fairly fundamental questions. What does the United States want in the long run and how does it go about uh, achieving it. And clearly, if the primary goal of the United States is to improve the well-being of its people, and it should be to improve the well-being of its people, because the United States is the only major developed country where the average income of the bottom 50% has gone down over a 30-year period. If that's the case, if the well-being of your people is the number one priority rather than the primacy of the United States in the world, then the well-being of your people is enhanced by working with China. And secondly, today, you know, we, it's now very clear we live in a small interdependent world. Our fates are interconnected, you know, our lives are intertwined. That's what COVID-19 is try trying to tell us. So we live on a small, uh, vulnerable planet and we have to come together to fix this vulnerable planet. And if that's a strategic priority, then that, everything else should be put aside and United States and China uh, should work together. That's why I end my book by saying that if U.S. and China keep on fighting while global warming is happening, future historians will see them as two tribes of apes fighting each other while the forest around them was burning. So our priority today is the burning forest, not, not primacy in the jungle. I agree 100%, but I would also argue that the odds of that happy outcome approach zero or rather that making long-term strategic analyses and choices does not seem to be particularly an American or even a Western habit these days. Everything I see and hear pushes us more towards that negative sum, if not a zero sum game that you suggest. So what if I'm right? Well, I, unfortunately, I wouldn't bet against you. Uh, when you say that the zero-sum game is likely to continue rather than the positive-sum game that I spoke about earlier. So the result of that will be that in the short run, the United States will score points, you know, because the United States is still the number one power, and so it will destroy maybe or damage a, a company like Huawei. It might uh, damage companies like TikTok. But the, the correlation of forces, to use an ancient Marxist phrase, uh, is working in China's favor. And uh, China will just keep on growing. China cannot be stopped. And the reason for that is that, and this is, I hope, I hope the most important statistic any, any Westerner should know, is that from the year 1 to the year 1820, for 1800 out of the last 2,000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. So the last 200 years of Western domination of world history have been an aberration. Uh, all aberrations come to a natural end, and we are going to see the end of the, uh, you're going to see the post-Western world emerge. So unlike the first Cold War, uh, which the United States launched against the Soviet Union, where its partners were as enthusiastic as the United States was in taking on the Soviet Union, right? The British, for example. This time around, when I was in Davos in January 2017, I met a very influential British person. So I asked him, are you going to choose Huawei? He said, of course we will choose Huawei. You know, we have put our GCHQ people into Huawei. We have scrapped the software and Huawei is not a threat to the UK. I said to him, come on, but surely the US is going to apply pressure on you in this British guys said, Kishore, the U.S. needs the U.K. as much as the U.K. needs the U.S. This is in January 2020. By July 2020, the U.K. had capitulated. Now, can you imagine? It, that's how you're going to get allies against China? By really applying pressure on, on all your close allies before they join you against China? That doesn't sound, seem like a winning formula to me at all. And so, uh, therefore, it's important for the United States to think very hard, very carefully, who's going to jump enthusiastically on, on, and support the United States. But to balance that, let me also say 
that everybody wants to see a strong United States. <laughs> we don't want to see a weak United States. And we wish the United States would focus on making its society strong again because a strong United States is good for the world. And a strong United States that can balance China is good for the world, but not an erratic, irrational, irresponsible United States. That's not what the world wants. Let's take that and shift the focus to Asia. You live in a small, arguably one of the most successful dynamic countries, I, I would have said in the region, but globally. As a small country, you have to surf the waves of geopolitics that confront you. You are a taker, not a, not a creator of those waves. How does Singapore, not just Singapore, other nations in the region, uh, adjust to this dominant position of China? Well, that's why I devoted an entire chapter of my book uh, has China won on how will other countries choose? And you're absolutely right. Everybody in this region is thinking very hard about what we do with this U.S.-China geopolitical contest uh, gaining momentum. I think there'll be very, very few enthusiastic supporters of the United States as it decides to take on China. The Chinese anticipated that the day would come when the United States might try some kind of containment policy against China. So in a preemptive strike against a containment policy, the Chinese made sure that all for all their neighbors, right, their number one trading partner was uh, China. And to give you an example how dramatic the Chinese could be, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, when it was set up, the Chinese denounced ASEAN as a new imperialist Western plot in Asia. They denounced it in 1967. And so our best friends were United States, Japan, Europe, Australia, South Korea. Guess what? Come the year 1999, the first country to propose a free trade agreement with ASEAN is not United States, not Japan, not Europe, not Australia, but it's China. And then China didn't just propose a free trade agreement. China negotiated it in record time, provided an early harvest of unilateral concessions to the ASEAN countries. And by now, the ASEAN countries, by far, the number one trading partner is China. So you can see that they anticipated a containment policy 20 years ago and started building up their defenses against it 20 years ago. That's what you call strategic thinking. And it has worked. It clearly has worked, but it's not always been so benign. I think of the Australian case uh, where the Chinese have recently and, and emphatically pointed out what they want and what they'll do if, in fact, they don't get what they want. So I'm not. Yes, the Chinese clearly understand the power of economics, the power of trade, the power of mutual benefit. They also seem to understand the power of the stick, don't you think? Absolutely. I, uh, let me assure you that uh, all great powers behave as bullies, <laughs> without exception. When the British number number one, they, gosh, they punch you in the face. <laughs> and and if the, when the Americans are still number one, they'll punch you in the face if you stand up to American, in the American way. So, and I think China will behave as a great power. But in the case of Australia at the same time, you know, I wrote a 5,000-word essay which was published in the Australian National University. And I pointed out that as Western power recedes from Asia, Australia will be left like, you know, the uh, somewhat unkind analogy, like the debris on the beach, you know, uh, when the Western power recedes. And so West, the, you, Australia will have to go through a very painful psychological adjustment because, you know, it's always cherished being a member of the Western club. And you notice that the other Asian countries behave in a certain way towards each other. And you will find, by the way, that even though countries, many countries in the neighborhood are not comfortable with China having so much power, but they realize that they, you, don't, you, don't, you don't express that by, you know, insulting them or criticizing them. And you find ways and means of talking to them privately and dealing with them. But the Australians still, still think that they are part of a sort of a number one club and sometimes say things in a way that, frankly, is unwise. And then they've got to make a psychological adjustment. And as a friend of Australia, I keep trying to suggest to them, hey, try to understand how Asians relate to each other. And maybe that, that's, that's the way you're going to learn to relate with the rest.
Let me ask my last question by going back to where we started. Your book asks, has China won? My question is, can we avoid war between the United States and China? Uh, absolutely, we can, because in a nuclear war, you don't have a winner and a loser. You have a loser and a loser. And I think one point which I hope all American strategic thinkers should take on board is that the Chinese are behaving very strangely. In their contest between the United States and Soviet Union, if the Soviet Union got 1,000 more nuclear weapons, the United States would get 1,000 more nuclear weapons. And if the United States got 1,000 more nuclear weapons, the Soviet Union would get another 1,000 more nuclear weapons. But today we live in a world where the biggest geopolitical contest is between the uh, United States and China. And the United States has over 6,000 nuclear weapons, and China only has 300, 5%. Now, isn't that a wonderful ratio? Why not preserve this ratio? Why start an arms race with China when you're so far ahead? So I, I find it quite strange that there are American voices saying we must strengthen our armaments, we must buy more arms. But for there'll be no war with China. And as George Cannon, as you know, George Cannon was a the key strategist for the U.S. in the Cold War against Soviet Union. He said, at the end of the day, the outcome of the contest with the United States and Soviet Union will not depend on how many bullets and bombs we have. No, it will depend on the internal spiritual vitality of its society. So the United States should cut down its defense budget, stop fighting unnecessary wars, take the $5 trillion from post-9-11 wars, give it to its own people, and focus on developing its own society. And therefore, it'd be so unwise for the United States to initiate an arms race with China. It's a, it's a lose-lose game. Thank you for that, because it is both a terrific observation and terrific advice. I hope someone's listening, because now more than ever, we really do need to think about where we're going and how we're going to get there. So thank you very much, Kishore, for your time. Thank you for the work you're doing, and please keep offering advice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments and please subscribe to other episodes in the podcast app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.